Duena, how are you? Good. Hi, Tom. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm so excited to have you on the show. Well, I'm excited to be here. This is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. We've been wanting to get inside the mind of Duena for a while now. <laughs> That's a terrifying concept, but I'll go for it, my friend. Yeah. Dark territory, you never know. Yeah. So people that don't know us don't even know what we're talking about, but you're an interior. Why don't I do this? Duena, who are you? And why are you talking to a worldwide group of leading edge, top-notch uh, furniture makers, cabinet makers, and architectural mill workers? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I identify as an interior designer. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very modern way to talk I'm about so yourself. I'm so with it. Like, be careful. I'm so with it. So current. But yes, that's what I do. I'm an interior designer. And I work in commercial and residential. Primarily residential interior mm -hmm. design is my focus. But um, I'm finding that commercial design, especially now, is much more directed towards making people feel comfortable and at home. Mm. Um, and I think as we transition back into homes, interior design is in a residential concept is more applicable in a commercial space. So we do both, but my heart is in residential interior design. Okay, great. Yeah. So that's good. And it's, you know, the reason I asked you to be on the show is because I want to get inside the mind of an interior designer because you guys are integral to the work that we do as cabinet makers or our, you know all the different trades within the wood trades because we need you. And I yeah. think you need us to make the oh, design elements oh, come to life. Hell yes, it's such <laughs> a big deal. Yes, definitely. Yeah. So let's talk about that. We want to get in. Uh, my goal for this call is that we understand what you need so well that when you, and not, I'm not talking about you as Duena, but you, you now represent all interior designers in the world, by the way. Right. No pressure. No pressure. None at all. Good. No problem. <laughs> but um, okay, we're good. <laughs> so tell me what you look for when you're working with uh, somebody who's doing uh, the finished wood for your projects. Um. So oftentimes we don't get a say in who the millwork contractor is on our projects. Mm. So when we've finished our ID construction drawings, when we go through a process of concept drawings, then drawings for tender and then drawings for construction. And so often what happens is somewhere in there, the contractor has the millwork shop that they prefer to work with. Mm. So it's generally under, often under the general contractors. So I get what I get. So when I submit my millwork drawings and schedules, mm -hmm. they go to a millwork shop. So what my dream scenario to get back from that yeah. millwork shop is, are shop drawings that are exquisitely detailed. <laughs> <laughs> and that, you know, I think you and I've chatted about this before is the responsibility of an interior designer. It's like in marriage therapy, you know, when, when I say to no, stay with me, this is okay. Be if I feel like this is a test, so I'm just going to okay. nod a lot, but go ahead. Good. That's it. See, you know, you've done this before. So, so in marital therapy or in couples or communication therapy, the person says something and then the other person repeats back what they said mm. to make sure that we understand each other in mill workshop drawings. That's what shop drawings are for is like, I've said what I want as a designer after working with my clients and right. I've said what I want. And then the shop drawings come back to me from the mill worker saying, this is what we understand that you meant by your drawings. Uh, and then we collaborate and I say, oh, cause it means my drawings weren't clear. So I go back and say, you know what? I didn't mean that, but thank you for pointing it out. And we tweak them. And then sometimes the shop will say, this can't be done. And in a perfect world, I get to talk to a mill worker during concept development so that I can yeah. say to them, is this possible? And then they can say, hell no. And then I can say, all right, tell me what I can do so that my, you know, my yeah. drawing, when they come to you. That, that, that statement is probably driving a bunch of our listeners nuts because they always have a way to do something, but it yeah. not, might, it, uh, I think structure, it'll look the way you want it to look, but it not, might, might not be built the way you think it needs to be built yeah, or engineered. Exactly. Yeah, but they can make it. These, the, the, this crowd can make anything happen. Right. And but but I think how they do it is the. Yes. And that's on them to tell us like, you know, we, we kind of 
I need to be educated by the people who are, who are fabricating the things I draw. Mm. And so I really respect what mill workers do. And I really respect their shop drawings. Like seriously, I swoon. When I get a good set of shop drawings back, it's like a swoon experience. It's like, oh my God, this is so beautiful. And then appreciating it, right? Like, yeah. Let me, can I stop on that for a second? Because sure. good mill, good mill work drawings might mean different things to different people. So yeah. can you give me the spectrum? the worst shop drawings you've had that, you know, when I say the worst didn't help you do your job or didn't bring the design vision to life all the way to what it really looks like when, when good is described on paper, what would that okay. be? So keeping in mind the intention as I see it of shop drawings are to affirm what's going to be installed. Hmm. They're an affirmation to say, this is what we're going to put into this building. Okay. So, if the shop drawings don't tell me that, then I'm panicking. Like I'm stressed because I'm thinking, oh my God, what if what shows up isn't what we promised the client that we intended with our interior design elevation drawings and, mm -hmm. and more drawings. So I get really anxious. So uh, the worst side of the spectrum, and I hate to say worse because there's mill workers who can do a pencil drawing and you're like, they know exactly what it is. I know that I trust them because they're skilled that, but they don't use, you know, modern tools. modern tools. They use their pen and paper. So that's unsettling if mm. I don't know them. So when I deliver elevations and plans and sections to a mill workshop and I get back a pencil drawing on grid paper telling me what I said, I panic. I just panic. It's like, oh my God, well, how is this going to happen? How is this client going to get what they want? And I right. won't sign on them. I just won't sign off on them. Because ah, okay. So there's a lesson. Yeah. You won't sign yeah. off. That doesn't meet. I say to the client, if you're comfortable with them or the contractor, sub, the general, if you're comfortable, sign off. I won't sign off on them because they're really not telling me mm. what I need to be assured that, that this is going to go into this project th with the vision. I'm sure they have it in their head, but our tools of communication in our business are drawings and it, and that's and specifications that's how we communicate sure so the so the, on the other end yeah they've got everything <laughs> they've got every electrical everything that's going in and out they've got all the finishes noted clearly and specified because we write specs we'll have a no work finishes oh, okay everything. you have oh, right we code everything but so then when they come back at us understanding all our specifications how it's going to come together and then give us the feedback but that's what shop drawings, when they come back and they're detailed and they're beautiful. And oftentimes they're, you know, sectioned and really broken down into like even the space underneath the kick and what's going back. It's beautiful. They're right. beautiful. They're and awesome. so when you get some drawings like that, and we're going to talk about the great drawings, how does mm -hmm. that lend itself to that mill worker getting more business? Well, do you and the builder then talk about it and say, these guys? I, are I praise them. Like I, I, and I always recommend them. So when I do have clients who come to me and say, who, who do, let's do my kitchen. Let's just say this, do yeah. my kitchen. So I design their kitchen. They say, well, who do we get to build it? And, and then I say, oh, I, know I right. got a guy. No, I know a guy. And then <laughs> I refer, I would never refer to anybody who gave me a, a sketch on a piece of paper. Pencil drawings. It, I mean, that used to be the case. That used to be the standard, um, but it's no longer exactly, the standard. But they're not, they're not even, uh, yeah, it's not good. It's yeah. not good. And it's different. I've also seen them render in 3D by in hand. There's not many of those left, the mill workers who do that. And that's right. beautiful. I've actually got a couple saved, a beautiful things that came out of it. It's like, these are pieces of art. They're beautiful, but that's not the kind of pencil drawings I'm getting. Right. Do you need 3D? Like, in, Because there are software and programs out there that I've seen for 3D renderings. Does that help you go back and ease the mind of the client that, hey, this is what we drew and this is what you're going to get? Sometimes, sometimes it's not necessary. If, if the mill workshop's using, you know, just elevation and sections and planned views, we can, we can, I can understand that. I mean, mm. I don't think it needs to be that complicated, although, you know, 3D is fun. Yeah. It's really fun. <laughs> but so, it's but where's the homeowner? Cause a lot of homeowners can't translate that 2D, you know, the flat drawing. They don't understand the space they're walking through. How can, yeah. how can you and the mill worker help that? come to life is it through 3d or is it through sometimes but it's it's not necessary i rarely have had a client that simply says oh, i just don't get it i mean mm. and really the reason they've hired us is because they trust us yeah. you know 
and we've already done all our upfront creative work. We, I know what they're trying to accomplish. We're not like nitpicking about, about stuff at that point. They know, like, I know what, how much door space they need. I know how many hanging space they need. I know how many doors and drawers, you know, we've got all that sorted. When the mill worker and I are working together, we're drilling down on details, like, you know, where the poles are going to sit on the door. And right. Where, you know, how, that was that a conversation of, I just had in the phone call before this one. Somebody, yeah. somebody got a call. They don't know where the handles are going to go. The conversation was two months ago now and nobody remembers. And that's why we have drawings. They're going to make a judgment call. And I said, yeah. you know, let's go back and figure that out. Why are we relying on, I'm going to go with my gut. Cause you're about to bore holes in a door. No, no. One more, one more reason for drawings. And so our tools of communication are drawings. It sounds boring as hell, but really that is, to me, a good set of interior mm. design construction drawings are the tool that brings everybody on the same page and makes us all friends at the end because we were all, we were literally operating off the same page. Right. And when something changes, then we do our revisions and we do our you know, change orders and we keep it all updated and current. And sometimes in, a, in the midst of construction, when things are on the fly, we panic and everyone's freaking out like, oh my God, we opened the package. They're not the pulls we thought, uh, and we all have to kind of, so we work it out, but stuff happens. But I think a good set of drawings with good, clear specifications and schedules, keep everybody, you know, queued up for success. You know, we set mm -hmm. each other up to win. We set each, all of us up to win. So I think that's why I'm really passionate about that we have drawings we have good drawings with good schedules and good specifications clearly laid out right. and approved by everybody and that's our job you know i mean everyone thinks we pick paint and it's really pretty but really what we do is we develop drawings and powerful tools of communication and contracts so that everybody understands what the expectation is or it saves so much disappointment when you work with a, uh, I'll just say a mill workshop and whether it's, they call themselves a cabinet shop or architecture mill work is just for this purpose, the same thing, but how can they communicate back to you in a way that works? You know, like, again, what's the best of communication? What's the worst of communication? Because sometimes something doesn't work for whatever reason, yep. or it needs to be modified regardless of, you know, how, what's the, what do you prefer as a communication um program i'm just going to say program to keep it high level what do you what works for you well initially if we submit our id drawings to millwork drawings to a sh to to a shop so we they go to the shop mm -hmm. they take a look at them they usually have questions typically i'm kind of nervous when they don't um so then usually they'll phone or they'll send me back my drawings with some markups on them pdfs with markups they'll do red markups or questions yeah. they'll come back to me and then if I don't understand their questions I'll give them a call maybe we can screen share have a conversation they'll show me a picture of what they mean like we have lots of ways of communicating to kind of we're in a relationship right so yeah. let's have a conversation and find the best way to convey what they're trying to say and and then the same back and then finally it all goes into one final set of drawings do you do you find it handy when a uh, when you could tell that the mill worker is actually a business person or like, hi, Duana, nice to meet you. We've got this job. Let's talk every Tuesday at two. And, you know, just to touch base, yeah. do people do that with you or is it random no. texts no. and crazy yeah, messages? Good and yeah. Good business practices are always awesome. Like, cause, cause I have a, my preferred way of communicating because I like to track. So when I get texts for questions on site, I get anxious because I think, okay, how do we track this? especially if the last questions were in a series of emails. So I think consistency and communication. And one thing I do love about our online design is that we have that back end of our website where it's one chat log that's all the time. And I love yeah. that. That's yeah. harder to do for, for contractors. And I understand that because they do have guys on mm -hmm. site. Like a lot of times I'll get a call and go, holy crap, there's this thing that's come up on site. And sometimes we do what we have to do to make it all resolved. So I'm, I'm good with it, but I do love to have like consistency um, in how we can. Yes, I know. So people listening to this episode may not know this, but I had Molly, who is, uh, what's her official title? Operations and Sunshine? Yes. <laughs> she was a guest. Oh, no, she named herself. Oh, did way. she? Yeah. Well, you both have the same smile. So there's the sunshine part. Yeah, the um, uh, She was on the Profit Tool Belt podcast talking yeah. about how to put systems in place in a business and run it like a business. 
And so it's not surprising for me to hear you say the same thing, that you value systems and process and yeah. consistency. And I agree, you said it's not exciting, but it works. Yeah, It's the same thing with what I do. It's not exciting, but let's lay out the path and then just march along the path and try to take all the surprises out of it. Because those surprises yeah. take time and they lead to unhappy customers and inconsistent results and Ugh. You know, it, it's a little bit, I admit myself, sometimes I get irritated with the clicking and saving. Like sometimes I just want to get the job done <laughs> and, you know, like I'll spread my stuff out I'm like, oh, and what do you mean? I have to sort it into organized piles, but you do. So it's sort of like going to the gym, you know, the end result sometimes is where you have to think about. So yeah. at the end of this project, how do I want to feel about myself? How do I want my client to feel about me? And how do I want all the trades that worked with me? How do I want them to feel? So if we're feeling based, if we're, if we're values and feeling based through mm -hmm. the process of construction, starting from concept to completion, yeah. how do we want to feel about ourselves, our client and our trades when we're done? And as a trade, it's the same thing. Like how, do you, you want them to love you. You want them to yeah. feel amazing yeah. Yeah. at the end. So if, I, if it takes me a little more time to put it in the right file, to sort it at the right time, to email when it would be easier to text, then so be it. That, that's the cost. That's the price I pay, a little right. tiny convenience to at the end of the day, have people saying, I love my house so much or my office or my studio. I'm so happy here. Thank you. And you walk away feeling really proud of what you've, what you've created for somebody with somebody. I'm uh, <clears throat> I mean, people may not know this, but the reason you're here is because you actually took interior design and you turned it into a remote delivery. Like people yeah. in, you know, if you were in Florida, they could be in Seattle. If you were yeah. in Vancouver, they could be in, uh, in Toronto. It doesn't matter where yeah. they are in the world. They can use your design elements. So you had to take this systems thing and this value driven business that you have and put it on paper. What was that process like? It was very time consuming and it was a lot of, you, know, you have to be willing to make mistakes and be disappointed and, you know, start over. Um, it was very difficult to take a service and turn it into a product. Hmm. And for me, the non-negotiable in the whole thing was um, that we represent really clearly the customization aspect of it for the client. And then we tried to boilerplate everything else. Oh. And by boilerplate everything else, it's, you know, all the information about, you know, how high to hang a light fixture, where your, you know, poles on your door should go, where yeah. your door handle should go, where your, you know, how high to hang your art, where your, you know, all that information. That's pretty standard. So what they ended up, where the interaction with us is strictly around what's your dream, what's your vision, how can we create that for you? And then we do drawings and specifications based on that. So a lot of clients do their own measuring. Some actually hire laser measure teams to come in on the larger projects. Okay. Yeah. Cause measuring can cause a lot of grief for people. If it's not measured well, right, then you go install it. And yeah, well, yeah, it's all, you know, you know, the, the old saying, right. <laughs> measure twice, got once, no kidding. <laughs> no measure kidding. Three times, measure no. more than that. Yeah. And Way measure more. the right things and Just the right way. Measuring. Don't stop measuring. But, but I think that, you know, if you teach people how to do something, so we have a package that we send clients to teach them how to measure something. If it's a larger project, we say, find a laser measure company who will send us a DWG file. But if it's a smaller project, clients can do their own measurements. We have a little package. We send them sill heights and <laughs> door openings. And, you know, we do all that. I, I have my hand up, Dwayne. I have a question. Yes, sir. There's a lot of people listening right now saying to themselves, well, you can't just have anybody measure. And to those people, I will ask you, what earth, uh, what above this earth entity gave you the only ability to measure a room. Yeah. It can be trained. Yeah. That's why it's in a textbook. It sounds like you're the way you guys do things with your, what do you call it? A virtual system or a remote? Well, we call it online interior design, but virtual design never occurred to me. Also really like that. Okay. That's so great. virtual interior design, but virtual you had to, online. you had to teach other people how to do measuring, but I get, I often hear back from people. Well, you can't, somebody else can't do measurements. Like, what are you talking about? Oh, of course they can. Yeah. You just have to show them how to do it. Exactly. So we have, so I guess a, you figured out a system. Yeah, we have a really fun system. We send this little package to clients and they measure up their furniture. They measure their art. They measure their rooms. Yeah. And I need to know things like what's your sill heights. I need to know where your outlets are. I need to know where your 
if you've got central heating, if you've got baseboard heaters, mm. if you've got a fireplace, how does it work? You know, I need all that information. So we've got this really fun package that they get. It's really encouraging. And then they send it back to us and then we put it in CAD and then we send it back to them to say, does this look like your room? Are you happy with this? <laughs> right. And then if we're missing anything, like yeah. we need a North arrow and you know, that kind of stuff. So we yeah. send it with fun. It's always super encouraging. We always celebrate all their wins and it's a fun process. And um, with bigger projects, like I said, I love my the team going in for the laser measure and I get all that information, like on a larger scale, we plug it into our AutoCAD system. Yeah. But, yeah. but I do appreciate when clients do their own measuring, it works, it works every time. And then we always say to them, you know, before you buy this light fixture, measure it, make sure it's the size that it says in the specification sheet, ensure that it's gonna fit it's going to fit through the door. It's going to come in your elevator. It's going to fit in your car. If you don't have a truck, like yeah. we talk about all that stuff in the process, but no measuring is, uh, something isn't rocket science. If, if you've got the right instructions. if you have the right instructions, it's confirming mm -hmm. those small details that helps. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm the king of missing the small details. Like I just came out with a book and I neglected to read the clause that said I had to buy 200 copies of my own book. And so oh now God. I've got I guess I know what I'm getting for Christmas next year, huh? <laughs> a couple of copies of my book. <laughs> it's a great on my I, Yeah, birthday. I'm not the detail guy. I'm definitely, you know, I need systems for details, but yeah. I can I can only laugh at how many times I've been caught by not being details. What I'm hearing from you is that those details and attention to the details makes the job go smoothly. 100%. And really what we do is detail oriented. Like it's all very well and good to pick a tile or to pick a millwork finish. Mm. It's great. But what do you know about that finish? Like, can it accept the kind of finish you're talking about putting on it? Do you know, you know, Oh, you mean the surface? Yeah. Can the surface accept all the finish? Of it. It's all relevant. And, and I think, you know, someone, some people have really concerns, but is it food safe? So we have to answer those questions. Those are the details that are necessary. So we're a detail oriented business it's what we do and a lot of people mm. miss that they always see the after pictures and they see it all finished and no one knows how we sweated over some of the details that were in that project and i think anybody especially millwork because it is so exquisitely detailed that when it's all done everyone goes oh, it's just a kitchen <laughs> it's just a bookcase it's like no it's not <laughs> no it's, there's a lot of soul love and sweat that went into that book case. there is yeah, yeah there is yeah. and I, I tell the people on this show all the time plum square and level is plum square and level there they yeah. listen to this show to get the inside scoop like normally we wouldn't get to hear from an interior designer mm. for a couple minutes talk about your world and the way you see it so that we know how to interact better with you what the expectations right. are both ways the people that are that just want to have their head down making great cabinets plum square and yeah. level they're probably not yeah. listening to the show. You know, they're, <laughs> it's just the case. This is and for business know, people who make cabinets. Yes. And I respect that. I understand that they've probably had some not great experiences with interior designers in the work that they do, where they don't respect the fact that someone has to fabricate it. And I think, you know, really respecting what each other does. Like mm. I, you know, I'm really appreciate when a male work says to me, male worker says to me, listen, this, there's a better way of doing this. It's like, then let's do it that way. It just, it's like, my ego's not, it's not, there's no room for it in the room, you know, it, this, cause it's not my room. Right. It's someone else's room. This is our client's we're, room. We're trying to make their and, vision come to life. Exactly. And do it in a price that they have a budget for. So part of that is communication. And without that, I just don't know how else we can do a good job for them. If we're ignoring each other or we're not respecting each other and what we do, then we disappoint the client and then we haven't done our job. Like that's the bottom line. If a mill worker wants to find more duenas in the world, wants to do more business and be the go-to mill worker for an interior designer like yourself or yeah. the builders you deal with, how do they do that? Where do we start by going to get the best interior designer in, you know, in their city? You know, I'm, I guess it's complicated in the sense of most of the time we're dealing with GCs. That's the, the part of it that's a little bit complicated. So right. if you're just pitching to interior designers, I guess the best way to do that is to look at their websites, look at the work that they're doing and have a conversation with them. And do they respect you and what you do? Because if they're just going to belittle you and, you know, not celebrate the work that you do, why would you work with them? If it's all about their ego. And, but I think if, if I think it's connect with the values. So search out interior designers in your town or city yeah. and see, look at their websites and see the kind of work they're doing and think, Hey, that's the kind of work I do if you see their designs and then, then reach out to them and just say, who does your mill work? And could I have you into my shop and show you what we do? Oh, great. So you would, 
Yeah, so you'd, you'd get invited now, assuming that the mask rules right now weren't what they are, but you, there's ways around it. You yeah. could face, you could do a FaceTime tour of the shop and- 100%, mill workshops are glorious places. They're fabulous. I love going to mill workshops. What do, do you look for? What do you look for when you go in? Well, Tell us. I look for how organized they are, to be honest. If there's dust and mayhem everywhere, they might be great. I don't know, but right away I feel uncomfortable. Like, is my project going to get mixed up with that project? Is that, oh. you know, how is this working? So when I see, and I see- the, the sort of the way they conduct themselves in the space, like how they're operating in the space. And you can see, you get a sense the minute you walk in a space of people yeah. who are passionate about what they do, who are proud of what they do, who love what they do, who honor what they do. Mm. And those are the kind of people that are, that make your work day amazing when yeah. you can celebrate the wins. It's not inconvenient and you know, you're not a, an inconvenience to them that you're a team with them. Yeah. That's really, really exciting. So I think that's the way, to approach interior designers is to just look at their work. And then if they don't respect what you do, if they belittle you or make you feel small or less than, don't, don't bother. <laughs> You're talking about <laughs> mill workers who make you as a designer. No, as designers make, uh, I hear oh. the other way around a lot. I hear a lot of trades talk about designers come on site and they're not Oh, respectful. with their nose in the air. Uh... A little bit. One, one um, mill worker called them the fancy leather pants ladies. <laughs> which I thought was awesome. <laughs> I love that. It's like, that, yeah. yeah, I knew exactly. I know who you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And they just come in and they're dismissive of what you do. They don't see what you do as so bloody important that, you know, you make them look good, you know, yeah. good trades make designers look good. And that's really how it works. Yeah. And so if you don't honor as a designer, if I don't respect and honor what a mill worker does for a project, I'm shooting myself in the foot. It's a yeah. bad practice. It's just bad practice. So part of me keeps coming back to the thought of samples, like creating mm -hmm. samples, uh, sticking to sample, you know, sample designs. And you brought it up with finishes and, you know, will the substrate take the, uh, the, yes. whatever we're going to apply to it. How do yeah. you, how do you deal with samples to make sure that first you're not asking for something wonky, you know, no. and now if you need it, cause you've got a sp super specific client, they're probably willing to pay for it. But how do you yeah. how do you make those sample kits so that that's a clear communication to the? Well, in our studio, owners. we have reps from the various um, suppliers who give us. So in my own studio, I have my samples. I have right. veneer samples, you know, all that kind of stuff available. And then what I do with mine is I'll say to the mill workshop, "This is the spec that I'm working with," or I'll say to them, "I'm looking for something like this. What do you yeah. recommend?" And then they'll send me some. Usually it's just links. We start with links and I look at them and go, I think that might work. Oh, and then okay. how do we get samples? And usually the manufacturers will supply us with samples. Right, right. The shop sometimes has to do the finishing. So because we can, because if we want dead flat or do we want 10% or, you know, what's our sheen level that we're looking for. So we play around with that. But typically I don't know if mill workers should be supplying, going to all the trouble to supply a sample if they don't have the project. To me, it's sort of dependent, at least in my world, if they have the, they've been given the contract, then we hammer down, then you better be doing samples. Like, cause then it's like, how else are we all going to agree? Mm. I might write the spec it's, you know, white Oak and it's going to have a 10% sheen. It's going to be lacquer and blah, blah, but they might come back and their idea of that is different than my vision of that. So of course samples are necessary. Yeah. So I think it's onerous for mill workshops to have every possible sample in the world, but I think they probably get to know their clientele and probably have samples that are cover the most standard stuff that comes along. We're getting complex then. Yeah. Have you ever dealt with a situation here where and this is a, a specific situation that happened with uh, an, actually an architectural millwork firm, but they, they're one of those firms that does high-end homes and TIs. So they're in that level of architectural millwork yeah. and they had to bring in, they had to use different distributors. One that did architectural panels or acoustical panels from Germany that turned yeah. into quite a disaster, just getting them overseas. And the other one was some pre-built lockers were specced. Mm -hmm. And these guys said, we can make those. But the spec was like, no, we have to have this from that distributor. And these guys are like, we make that all day long. And so how do you, how can, how can a mill workshop have that conversation with you and the builder to say, look, I know what you guys spec and you can have it, but we don't have to go through this Austrian firm that says they're the only ones who can cut wood that way. Like, how, how do you bring that up as a conversation? Well, I'm super pragmatic and practical. So my practical side would just not understand why that 
I, yeah. I get you too. I think on the the specialized panels, that's different because they're yes, understandable. Engineered, yeah. The question is the why, like why. So what's better? I think just having those kinds of conversations. If everyone understands the why of a specification, if it's a floating and this thing has legs, well, okay, that makes sense. Like we need a floating installation. The only option in that's legs, okay. But if someone can tell me I can fabricate that here for less yeah. money and faster. I don't understand like why that wouldn't be the way yeah. we would go. So, I'll tell you, I was stuck as well. I was like, why can't this be made a logical discussion? But they offer kept- offer an explanation for that? Like, was there, what was the, ex- there has to be some kind of an explanation. Yeah, well, and remember I'm third removed from it. I only hear about right. it in the coaching meeting, why yeah. this is a problem yeah. and that they're dealing with the problem. And yeah. actually it leads to all sorts of other issues because now the line of credit of the mill workshop, they've had to go purchase this product and warranty it even though they don't know it. And remember, this is a TI, a commercial TI thing. So there's right. yeah, other yeah. design elements there, but yeah. uh, there are times though, when I know mill workers look at jobs and go, oh, we can make that or we can do it better. Yeah, You're saying you're open to that conversation as long oh. as it's approached respectfully and like, hell yeah, here's an idea. Oh my God, every day, that makes so much sense to me. Like if you're gonna streamline the project, if you're gonna bring it in, at budget or below budget and mm. faster and give us the same product with the same warranties. Like, yeah, yeah. let's do that. It let's seems like that. a bit of a no brainer. There must be another cog in that wheel that we don't know about it because well, that's very, yeah. Very, yeah. I don't understand that. Yeah. That's with the funny. acoustical panel, the acoustical paneling. I think I understand because you probably yeah. can't recreate that, but yeah. Wood is wood. And, and the mill workers and the cabinet makers here take, architectural challenges as a challenge they enjoy like I can make that yeah Yeah. oh my god yeah it's a great it's absolutely that the challenge is 90 percent of it it's exciting how does speaking of challenges how does somebody like I'm thinking of my listeners here how would they use the design this virtual or online design that you do in a situation where they don't have a designer but be are being challenged either for time or for you know delivering it by a client can they is that something they can do? Just call you guys and get oh, yeah, you to absolutely. design their kitchen? Totally, 100%. And if they send us, um, of course, all we need, we always need, we need dimensions. You need the, you need the drawings? We you need, need measurements? Drawings. We need sizes. We need to measure it. The measurements, and then if they want us to engage, if we're engaging with the mill worker exclusively, we never talk to the client, then we can do that too. Okay, great. Um, but in a perfect world, we would be able to communicate with the client. So sometimes what, what contractors will do is they'll introduce their clients to us and then we have a conversation and then we present to the contractor, say, this is the stuff we've come up with. What do you think? Get the feedback. Is this doable or not doable? There's a better way. And then we go to final. We do drawings and from that. I, 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 often, I often have this discussion with shop owners and it comes down to at the end of it, no designer, no deal. Because if they're, if a designer like yourself isn't involved, then the shop owner has to do it. And I'm just going to say it on behalf of everybody else. You're actually not a good designer if you're running a millwork shop. You're probably okay, but you're not the greatest. You're really good at running the shop and on the tools. And, and so it's nice to hear that even GCs are saying, okay, now you have to get an interior designer. Because a GC can do the design, yes. but they know that they should get yeah. a pro. Yeah. Exactly. And the same thing with, with mill workers, if they're, they're struggling with the project and they need someone to work with the client to kind of get out the ideas out of the client's head and onto paper. Oh my gosh. It could take so much time. I don't know how you have the patience to deal well, with a client know, who says, I don't know what I want, but I can see it in my head. You're like, oh. Well, yeah, you know, and that, that is our job. Like that is our job. So our job is to get the ideas of their head and onto paper. So it's a process and we always make it fun and interesting. And you know what I always find it's interesting with human nature. It's like people always know what they don't want, mm. but it's a real challenge to get people to say what they do want. Like, tell me what you want. It's like, well, I don't like that. And I don't like that. And I know I don't like that. I really don't like that. So we do have to do a deep dive with people. So a lot of the upfront stuff we do with people is get their ideas out of their head and onto right. paper. And that yeah. is our job. That's, that's our job. And I can, st- and I, you know, I advocate for my clients. If somebody says, well, why don't we just do it like that? It's like, well, I know this part is really important to them. So I don't want to shift on that, but I think that we have some potential for flexibility on this. So I can then advocate for my clients mm. in those communications with the, with the shops. Yeah. So cool. It is well, really cool. <laughs> Uh, and, it, and it's good to have you here sharing this. I mean, thank you, because we need to know this. And it's a good reminder for shops that are already dealing with designers how to better work with their designer. 
Yeah. Um, I, I think it's neat that we can get a designer, ev- like we can use you guys or this online tool that you have yeah. as a time saver for me as an owner, because it eats so much time when somebody's going to come by my shop, sit in my office for six hours talking about their cabinets and it's just wasting that business owner's time. Mm-hmm. Why not get a designer involved? And if you're a virtual mm-hmm. designer. Yeah. And we, we do love, we love working with people like the, the people in their homes or people. You're a people homes. person. That's for sure. I can tell. Well, you know, I think people need to be heard and taken care of. I feel like they matter. And so if it matters to them, it matters. So my job is to, you know, take what matters to them and turn that into a tool of communication for the person who has to fabricate it. That's the idea. And so I think what a lot of people don't do, and this mm. is a business thing, is I don't think we listen enough to the people we serve. So I think we need to ask, do more asking than telling. And I think that's true no matter what your business is with your clients. Do more asking than telling. Because the more asking you do, the more you learn about them and about what drives them and about the why in their whole project. Why are you doing this? If you can understand that, you can solve a lot of problems before they happen. So I think the important conversations are about people's why. Get to their why. Yeah. Get to that, and then you 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 can run with it more or less. Run with your project. I am so impressed yeah. you said that. That was management and leadership training by Dwayna Sprig. And <laughs> would, if I had a mic, I would drop it right now. <laughs> you drop the mic and walk off the drop screen. I just walk off screen. Yeah, for sure, I would do that. Yeah, but you're right. I mean, that applies in so many situations. Do huh. more asking. Yeah, and and you know like. Less telling, more asking. Yeah, less telling, more asking. If everybody takes that as a challenge this week, just with your staff, do less telling and more asking. Just for one week with your team, see what change there is. Oh, and you know, you learn so much more. Like I used to sit down with clients and we'd present a concept to them. We'd show them the concept stuff and they'd start saying what they didn't care for. And then then it's like, just shut up and listen. Let them run through this. Mm. You've already done, you know, they listened to me while I presented the why this is why we did this. this is why we use this particular tile. This is why mm. we use this finish. We have that conversation. And then they go through the presentation and they start saying things like, I don't think I like that. And, and like, you need to shut up and let them run through their dialogue. Because half the time, by the, the they get to the end of it, they go, oh, now I see why you picked that. Yeah, like, instead of arguing at every point. Exactly. Listen, in let them do their process. If you let people process, they get back to and then yeah you might need to change something to respect them or to understand you hear they learn we all win so yeah listening asking tons of questions just tons of them gets you way farther ahead than just telling them stuff we kind of had this conversation with molly on the the interview that i did with her which was that when i build an sop a system or a process with one of my team uh or for my company and I put it in front of my team and they come back, let's say it's a, a six or seven point system and they argue about point three. They're like, Dom, point three doesn't work. It's never going to work. Okay. But all the other points are good. They're like, yeah. Okay, well, let's run with it. And then what yeah. I hope is now they've bought into it. Now it's their system, whatever it is, a new way of manufacturing or new way of selling or marketing or installing, whatever it is. But then when they come back and they go, hey, you know, what? we're missing a step between two and four. What do you think, Dom? <laughs> if we do this and then I will sit back and this is not the time to be a smart, you know what? And no. be like, huh. There's tell no me about, Tell me about that. And they're like, you know, we got to do, we have to do this. And you're like, okay, let's add that to the system. Yeah. Yeah. But now what's happened is as a leader, I'm just trying to lead. I'm not trying to win. Yeah. I'm not just trying right. to lead. Right. Exactly. So let them put that back in the system because to your point, now they understand why that tile with that threshold yeah. had to work with that transition strip yeah. with that blah, blah, blah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, be- it's way better. And and besides, it's less exhausting. It's less exhausting. You can just let them wind down, let them finish up, and then, yeah. okay. And then it just makes life so much more comfortable and the yeah. process more enjoyable for everybody because people want to feel like they're heard. We all want that. Everyone wants to feel seen and everyone wants to feel heard. And I think if you give that to people, it's a gift. Yeah, It's a very generous gift to give to people. Uh, I want to find out more about how you guys do this virtually. Can you take two minutes and tell us about your virtual design as we start to wind down the interview? Sure. Um, so Good Space Plans Online, that's how that's what we go by. Um, Good Space Plans 
mygoodsplaceplan.com is how we run it and uh-huh. that's our website so people will show up there and they ask for a quote for their project so we can do renovations that method um like a re and re for a kitchen bathroom you know those kinds of things major renovations we shift to a different model but we have a website that has a designated chat area it teaches them how to do their measuring of their room how to upload pictures of the stuff they want to keep the pictures of the rooms we're going to be working on and they have the form they follow tons of questions. We put them through a really fun questionnaire and then we have a virtual meeting where by then I've got their drawings up in a, in a CAD format in plan view. So we go through that with them and talk about their vision. They've done idea boards. They've done all the back work before I even talk to them. So I've got a measurements of their room, all the pictures of their rooms. I've got their idea books on Pinterest and Howes and a long yeah. questionnaire from them. So that's all done. And then I have my first meeting with the client. Up till then, they've been working with Molly. Right. With the sunshine and operations portion of things. Right. And then we have our first design meeting. And by then, I know these people. I know their pets. I know their kids. I know them. And then we have this amazing meeting where... I show them their drawing on my screen or sharing a screen and we're talking on the phone and I can show them everything, go through their idea books and ask them the why of why they picked it, what they love about it. Do they agree with it? La da da. Then we go, we do the preliminary layout. We have cute names for all this too, but it's basically a space plan. I I sense that you bring fun into a lot of the things that you do. (laughs) Hey, listen, if it's not fun, I'm not interested. It's it's just stuff happens, uh, you know, anyway. So let's have a good time while we're doing this. And then we... I show them their layouts and it's some of the materials. I maybe pick two different tiles if we're doing their bathroom, a couple of faucets and we, and we get three meetings. So they have, they know they have to be efficient. They're, they're coached to be efficient. And by the time we get to that meeting, then I send them all this options I've done for them, the layouts, the options, they come back with their choices. We build them their final plan and we deliver it to them. And that final plan is in a PDF format and it has all their specifications the faucets, the poles, the color of the millwork, the everything. Do you know what occurs to me here, Duena? And you have to correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm, I'm willing to be wrong. But if I'm in, I'm going to choose the geographic center. Let's just say Omaha, Nebraska. And I, that's yeah. probably not the geographic center. But let's just say I'm in Omaha, Nebraska. Yeah. And I'm a cabinet shop and I'm falling apart at the seams because I'm getting caught in the design work for my clients. Yeah. Is this virtual tool that you have a way for me to offload that design work to you guys to virtually put the room together and then have it come back to me, which is what I want to do is build the darn thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. what we do. And we'll do um, for kitchens we'll, and bathrooms, we'll do the elevations. We'll do plan views and elevations and we'll specify yeah. the material. So it's going to have a Caesar stone countertop or it's going to have a shaker style door with the paint gray shaker door. It's going to have, you know, wh- whatever the material is the client wanted the height of the kicks. We do all that. That's all in our drawings. Yeah. And then the millwork can then take that and do whatever they want with them in their shop drawings and put it together and do the price for the yeah. client. Then they can shift and say, you know what, this pull looks like that. It might be cheaper. By that point we're detached. We're detached. But do you, but do you work with the milk? Cause I'm thinking about a busy mill workshop. Who's the, where the owner typically, or maybe one or two people in the office are totally slammed for time. Mm-hmm. And a lot of that time goes into the handholding of the client. Is this a chance for you to partner with that mill workshop and do the design work so they can stick to running their business and building stuff? I don't see why not. It, just, it sounds mean, to me like a great time. It sounds to me like a system, a process, maybe even if it's yeah. transitional, you know, for yeah. the, a couple of years, we use that system until we can afford to bring on our own in-house designer. No offense. Yeah. But that yeah. sounds to me like a smart way to subcontract a piece of the business that's just eating my time. Yeah. And if they're doing all the measuring, like if they're doing all the measuring. Well, I mean, measuring only certain people in this world have been blessed. If they send (laughs) their measurement angels and geniuses in to measure the space and get that back to us. I shouldn't make fun of it, but yeah, you know, I think everybody takes it. I I feel sorry for the person who ever said that to you. They are getting really (laughs) good. They have lost all credibility, all their goodness gone. You know what happens though, is you start to get into a place where, because we're so caught up in our work, we think we're the only ones that can do it. I know. I feel like that every day. You know, so my dad, I'm going to tell you this story about my dad, old Italian guy. He actually bought a cottage, like a cabin in the woods. And for my dad, having that cottage is a big deal. He came to this country with like nothing. And so the fact that he had a cabin is a big deal. And so when he, and he was a metal fabricator, but on his weekends, he would go up there and tinker on the cottage, which is 
crazy to me because why wouldn't he do nothing on the weekends instead of doing more hard work? But this yeah. front door that he worked on was the only thing he could work on. And he couldn't get the lock to work. So one night we're getting ready to go to bed and I go to close the door and it bounces. It won't, you know, the lock won't catch the lock won't catch. And I'm like, dad, this, the front lock's not working. And he'd been working on it so long. His only answer is you don't know how to use a door. And I'm like, yes. oh, dad, and that's the only I, explanation there could be. Cause I don't know how to use a door. Yes, that's true. That, that is absolutely it. That could be, what else could it be? Seriously. Seriously. You don't know how to use a door. And I, I mean, but he, he was so into that door yes. and that door lock. Yes. And, and maybe we're me. the same. We get caught up. We're the only ones who can we do. We do. And I think if we don't have empathy and compassion in this process, you know, I find myself getting really annoyed sometimes with people who keep bugging me, but at the same time, I think, well, what about, how are they feeling? Maybe they don't understand the process. How can I explain the process better? Because if, you know, you know, this being in business, if you had a bad client, how'd they get to the door? Who opened oh, the door? Yeah. Like, it's so Let's often- Let's go back and figure out how that happened. Yeah. yeah. It's like, it's not about them. It's like, where did I miss the flag? Oh, and then I missed the second flag. And then I got hit in the head with the brick and I still <laughs> didn't, you know? Yes. It's not their fault. <laughs> yeah. It's so, not the client's you know, fault. They're just being the client. You took and them it's as not for, yeah. Exactly. And it's not for everybody to measure their own space. Like I have compassion for people who say, I swear to God, I, and it's really, I don't want to do this. It's okay. Hire somebody to do it. Yeah, there's people, there's 100%. students that'll do it from the university. One hundred percent, and we've got our little instructions of how to hand that to them, get them to measure it up, and we get a second chance. It comes to us, we put it on DWG file, send it back in a PDF. Does this line up? We're missing. We, we're, these aren't working. We get yeah. it sorted out in two conversations. That's how long it takes to get their plans done. I love the systems focus that your company has. I'm actually, yeah. I'm very curious about it. So, oh, I love well, it. Someday we'll have to walk you through that website and show you how it actually works. Something yeah. Because like it is pretty, it blows me away actually. And it's old now. We're just redeveloping. And you life. built it. You built this from scratch. We did. We, well, you know, smart people that know how to do code did, but yes, we designed it and we had it built. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and at the time, you know, it was really revolutionary in the sense of like, it was so new, but now, you know, it's getting, it's getting it's tired. So I know that feeling where you're just tired. No, it's well, yeah, tired. But you have a system that works. Yes, and of course you want to tinker with the system that works. Yeah. And there's always improvements to be made. And now we're learning so much. We're getting feedback from clients. And now we're going to implement like this new customer experience on the back end of the site. So that's pretty exciting. Not my realm, Molly's realm. <laughs> Molly will but take care of that. That's okay. Pretty that's cool your though. Team. Yeah. It's pretty cool. So, I mean, if somebody wants to get in touch with you or find out more about how you guys do what you do, how do we find you in the big wide world? Best place. I have, we have two brands, Dwayne Sprague Interior Design, which is the full service, but we also have Good Space Plans Online. So the best place to go find us is through Good Space Plans Online. And if they want to email, that's goodspaceplansonline.com. And they want to email us, it's just, what is it? Info like, at. Hello. Hello. Oh, hello. Okay. Hello at mygoodspaceplans.com. That's you, the best Do way. you and have somebody our- calling to you from the, is Molly in the background? coaching you on this no but sometimes i feel like she's in my ear like there are times i'm like jesus she's not even in the just, room i can hear her yeah, she's yeah. saying things i just have to like think about her and the words come in my ear so yes she's got all these handles that she has and we're our social media stuff's all on our website also so right okay well i so much appreciate you being here educating the the, the community of woodworkers and architecture mill workers because you're speaking directly to the people that are are making your vision come to life so it's we nice. We appreciate that. Like, thanks to them. Seriously. Because it's just paper till it gets to them. So. Yeah. And then they make it happen. Make it magic happen. It's amazing. It's yeah. Amazing. Well, they take it seriously. They love what they do. Oh, I you know. know. I love it's, the smell of a wood shop. The smell of sawdust. Stuff getting done. It's a wonderful smell. It's a beautiful thing. I think trees hate that smell, but I love that smell. True. But we, you know, we're reusing stuff now too, right? We're doing a lot of really interesting recycling of materials and a lot of millwork materials are coming around to being recycled and reused and some really interesting materials. It's beautiful. It's very exciting. It's yeah. a really cool thing. Yep. Cool. Well, thank you so much for being with us. I appreciate it. And people can reach you at mygoodspaceplansonline.com. That's correct. Okay. Well, thank thanks, Duena. Have a great day. Thank you too, Dom. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Well, it's time for Dragon's Eggs with Rick Tack. Rick, can you give us some real world advice and guidance from the 
from the mindset of a foreman, from a mindset of a guy who has always had to keep the shop running efficiently and effectively. Well, here's a good one, Dom. If the worker hasn't learned, the instructor hasn't taught. Now, you, instead of instructor, you can say foreman or the teacher or whatever, but that, that's a straight uh, quote from training within industry, job instruction training. And really what it speaks to is it's the person's responsibility who's training, who's orienting the, the employee to make sure that they understand. They need to be able to know that the worker knows what to do. And so they're just doing follow-up. So I hear a lot of times comments from people, supervisors, owners that says, you know, that person just doesn't get it. They, they, they're just not getting it. And I say, well, have you trained them properly? How, how do you know that they know what to do? There's a real science behind, you know, how to train somebody properly so that you can get the right feedback and, and learn that they're a competent worker. So the call to action today would be, you know, if you're interested in learning more about uh, tr training with industry, job instruction, how to train properly, uh, you can text the word SWIFT to 604-837-8361. And Dawn, that's your dragon's egg for the day. Thank you. Perfect.